So ever since I made this video about using compu shaders for huge battle simulations, I've always wondered what more I can do with compu shaders. Since then, I've used compu shaders for procedural destruction, a ray tracing exploration, a 2D softbody physics simulation, a 3D softbody physics simulation, and even a 2D lighting system. I've learned a lot making these projects, and today I'll be showcasing a use for compu shaders that is a little more out there. In this video, I'll be going over how we can use compu shaders for a city simulation. Testing this simulation on my machine, I can simulate over 1 million citizens in real time and at a steady 80 frames per second. Before we get started, I'd like to mention that the source code is linked in the description, so if you're interested in that, go ahead and check that out. Exploring compu shaders has been very entertaining for me and I hope for all of you watching my journey. And for those who don't know what compu shaders are, I recommend checking out that first video about using compu shaders for huge battle simulations. I'm getting a bit tired of explaining what they are, and that video is also pretty informative in a lot of other ways, so I'll link it in the description. And with that out of the Way, let's dive right into the video. I'll be using the Bevy game engine and the Rust programming language for this project because realistically I won't really be making a game in pure OpenGL. I decided to create the project in 2D at first because I just wanted to get a proof of concept up and running. So the obvious first step is to create a render pipeline. We're going to be using an optimization called instancing to render the people in our city simulation. I used a similar technique in this large scale tower defense game I made in the past but there are additional benefits to doing this with compute shooters which I'll go into later. Anyways, instancing makes it so that we batch all of the instances we want to draw the people in our simulation into one singular draw call. This is possible because all of our citizens will use the same mesh, which in our case is just a simple quad. And this quad is what you're seeing on screen right now. Then, if we pass in a texture as a uniform variable and sample that texture in a fragment shader, we can turn this quad into an unanimated sprite. To animate our sprites, we can add a frame variable to each of our instances to represent which frame of the animation we are currently on. And we can update this frame variable using a compute shader, which increments this variable over an interval. Finally, we can modify which part of our sprite sheet we sample from in our fragment shader, which will give us an animated instance sprite rendering pipeline. Now, something you might be noticing right now is that we have a lot of sprites being rendered and not just one. I think it might be time to explain why instance rendering is so advantageous for compute shader based simulation. Compute shaders work by updating storage buffers and these storage buffers reflect change by rendering in some way. In our case, we are updating a storage buffer which contains a reference to an array of citizen structs which contain important information such as their position. Let's compare the vertex input and the citizen structure. The last three variables in our vertex input look exactly like our citizen structure. These last three variables actually represent an instance layout. This is how the instancing pipeline works. Each instance or citizen in our case has the same vertices except the data contained in their instance layout is different. In our rendering code, we can then use this instance data to for example render vertices at an offset position based on the position of the instance. This also means we can reuse the same storage buffer object that we pass into our compute shader to get modified for the instance layout, meaning instance rendering with compu shaders has very good synergy and we won't have to waste time creating new storage buffers or cloning existing storage buffers. Next, I ported over the collision code from the compu shader battle simulation project I originally made for my first dive into compu shaders. Well, ported over is a little bit of an overstatement because you can visually see how choppy the simulation is right now, which might be a little confusing because the FPS counter clearly shows that our simulation is running at consistently above 100 frames per second. The reason for this choppiness is because we are running our physics update on a very slow fixed time step. This is actually one of the primary optimizations I made to be able to simulate so many units in real time. And I think it's a good point to explain the optimizations that make physics possible for 1 million units in real time. So let's take a dive into that. The first and most important optimization is spatial partitioning. I go into a lot more detail in my original battle simulation video, but the goal of spatial partitioning is to limit collision checks between units that are very far away from each other. Without spatial partitioning, we would have to check every unit with every other unit to see if they are colliding. This would mean running a nested for loop, which we don't want because this would mean 1 million units need to perform 1 million squared collision checks, which is a number I'm not even going to bother calculating. Instead, we assign each unit a hash ID based on where they are located on a grid. We then use a multi-threading friendly sorting algorithm, which I chose to be by tonic merge sort, to sort the units in our citizen array based on this hash ID, so that the units in the same grid are next to each other in this array. We then loop through all our units and only perform checks with units in the 8 surrounding grids. 
Obviously, that was just a quick summary. I strongly suggest checking out that first video on compute shaders if you are really interested. I fully described the Bitonic Merge Sort algorithm in that video and how I implemented it without recursion, which isn't supported on most GPU hardware. Anyways, moving on to our second optimization, which I already briefly mentioned. We run physics on a very slow fixed time step, which is the reason our simulation seems so choppy right now. But if we add some interpolation between frames where we aren't actually performing physics calculations, it actually runs pretty smoothly and it looks smooth even though we aren't really performing physics updates every frame. This optimization is kind of finicky but I think it is necessary if we are to simulate so many units. You might notice a very large texture being rendered in the background. Even though the obvious next step is to implement some agentic behavior for our citizens that isn't possible until we create an environment for them to actually navigate. That large texture in the background is the start of a city rendering shader that I started writing. But before that let's create a simple city generation algorithm. The focus of this video isn't on procedural generation generation, so the city which I generate is going to be super simple and honestly kind of ugly if you just zoom out of the scene. It really consists of two steps. We first pick a certain amount of random points. Then in our second step, we run a nested for loop through all of these points and connect them first on the horizontal axis and then on the vertical axis so that we basically form an L path that connects each node with every other node in the scene. It's obviously worth mentioning that our city is going to be a simple tile map. Obviously this results in a city that doesn't exactly seem very natural, but again the focus of this video is more on GPU agents and crowd simulation and less on the actual city generation process which can be easily improved with some research so I decided to just roll with our current algorithm. The city we generated is going to be very large so some of you are probably wondering how these tens of millions of tiles are being rendered without being a bottleneck to our simulation. Well it's actually super simple. Since the city which we generated is basically just a glorified tile map we can actually render all of these tiles on one quad. Let's take a peek at the shader which is responsible for rendering the city. First, we're going to pass in a tile set texture as one of the uniforms in our shader. We're going to be sampling from this texture to render our city. Of course, we don't just want to render the tile set itself onto our quad, so we need some sort of way to know how our city is structured. I can't tell if this is the best solution, but I decided to pass in a shader storage buffer object, which consists of an array of road structures into our road rendering shader. With data on the GPU, we can access information on how our city is structured while we are rendering the city itself within our shader. In our fragment shader, we convert the current texture coordinate using some simple rounding operations to an index within our array of roads. And using this index, we can access the road object which corresponds with the texture coordinate we are currently rendering. This road object enables us to figure out which part of our tile set texture we should be sampling from at our current texture coordinate, and we can then use a modulus operation to figure out a sort of local texture coordinate to sample within our tile set image. This worded explanation might not have been the most clear, but you can probably figure out what I'm doing if you just take a look at this source code which you can examine more carefully by clicking on the link in the description. Now we can actually work on the main part of this video, which is implementing GPU agents to actually navigate these roads. Right now, I'm just spawning the agents in a random box around the scene, but it would look really unpolished if every agent had to wander onto a road at the start of the simulation, and they were just overlapping with all the buildings. So let's spawn the agents at the start of the game, making sure that they are positioned onto a road grid during the startup frame of the simulation. Now let's explain the actual behavior behind these GPU agents. First, we make it so that our citizens walk in different directions if they are on the right or left side of the road. This is very easy to do within our compute shader. First, we find the local coordinate of the current citizen on the grid which they are on. Then, we check whether they are on a vertical road or a horizontal road tile depending on whether the atlas frame of our road is 1 or 2. We can manipulate their vertical or horizontal directions accordingly depending on which half of the road they are on. Since our road tiles are not actually the full size of a grid, I also made it so that if our citizens wandered into the edges of our tiles too much, we could adjust their direction accordingly to stay on the colored portion of the tile. Then, we check whether our citizen is at an intersection, which corresponds to whether the frame variable of our current grid is equal to 3 or not. If we are at an intersection, we have a choice to make. We can either go straight or make a turn on the half of the road that we are on. Basically, if we're on the left side of the road, we can either turn left or go straight. Obviously, there are corner cases where we aren't able to go straight or turn left. I decided to store this choice in a variable called intersection decision, which resets to negative 1 whenever we are not at an intersection. So obviously, within an intersection, we should check whether we've made a decision or not. If we haven't yet made a decision, we generate a random number from 0 to 1 using some pseudo-random trigonometric manipulation because we aren't able to actually use any random functions within a computer shader. If the number is less than 0.5, we will make a turn, otherwise we go straight. I'm not sure if the way I implemented this logic is the best way because it honestly seems kind of confusing looking back at it and not all that elegant, but I'm just trying to make sure that things work correctly. 
actually. Anyways, we're done programming the basic wandering behavior of our citizens. I did make a few fine tuning changes later on, but this is the basic idea of how our citizens will function. And you can see that it is mostly robust with our citizens moving around seamlessly on screen right now. I started off by just adding some extra tiles to the scene so that it looks more like a city. We add building tiles wherever there is space and grass tiles if there isn't space for a building. It definitely looks a lot less bleak than it was before. Then I made the citizens have different animations depending on which direction they were walking in and this helped add an extra layer of realism to the world. Then I gave the citizens different colored clothing just to give the world a little more liveliness and we're basically done with the video. I hope that everyone enjoyed this video and found it interesting in some way. If you made it this far into the video, it would really help motivate me to post more content if you could hit that like and subscribe button. I look forward to seeing everyone in the next video.